بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Dear respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to another episode of Ask Iman Broadcasted live from the studio of Iman channel on Sky 757 We're also live on our social media platform So please don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Instagram and Facebook page Follow our Twitter handle And of course we're also live on our website, imanchannel.tv As you know, this is a live interactive Q&A program So if you have questions, then please feel free to pick up the phone and dial 0203-515-0757 Alternatively, you can drop us a text on WhatsApp Or to our international viewers, you can call us through our WhatsApp on 0791-684-1483 And all the necessary contact details are displayed at the bottom of your screen Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion, but before that, let us introduce our today's guest, none other than internationally renowned scholar, Fadilatul Sheikh Ad Dr. Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Brother Qamarul Islam. May Allah bless you and the viewers and all of us. Thank you so much for hosting me today. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for giving us your valuable time. Let's move on to our discussion straight away. Um, we'll write, well, I'd like to start our discussion with the reminder the month of Shawwal is coming to an end. If we haven't completed our six Shawwal fast, if you can just give us a brief reminder and then inshallah we'll continue to our main discussion. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala nabihi wa mustafa wa ba'd. All praises due to Allah when we praise him and we seek his help whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves astray none can show him guidance um, as we all remember that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said in the hadith whoever fasts during the month of Ramadan and then follows that by, by fasting six days during the blessed month of Shawwal the Almighty Allah will grant him a reward equivalent to the reward, to the reward of fasting for the entire year. The month of Shawwal is ready to depart. Today is the 24th of Shawwal. So uh, six days barely remain, which are barely enough for those who did not fast whatsoever. They can begin tomorrow, inshallah. The good news about the fasting of the six days of Shawwal that it doesn't have to be consecutive. So those who started from the beginning of Shawwal, they could have fasted on Mondays and on Thursdays. And by that, in a couple of weeks, they would have finished. But only if you did not begin yet, and you were just reminded right now, Alhamdulillah, you still have a chance. As I said, today is the 24th of Shawwal. So you can begin, inshallah, uh, tomorrow. But you will have to fast them consecutively until you finish them. This is an opportunity not to be missed. And it's only during Shawwal. So fasting those six days in Shawwal are related to fasting the blessed month of Ramadan. There are many uh, deduced wisdom from the Hadith, as uh, Ibn al-Jawzi said, that one of the major signs, the prominent signs of the acceptance of our deeds is to follow the good deed with another good deed. So those who fasted during the Faridah and will continue afterward in Shawwal by fasting, the voluntary fasting, this is a sign that their fasting has been accepted. And that's why this is an opportunity not to be missed. The Almighty Allah says in the end of Surah الأنعام من جاء بالحسنة فله عشر أمثالها. So the least reward for any good deed the believers would do is to be rewarded for it ten times more. So that's why, mashallah, fasting only the six days of Shawwal along with fasting the blessed month of Ramadan will be as if you have fasted for the entire year. 36 days times 10, that's almost an entire year, even more than a lunar year. May the Almighty Allah accept. The Almighty Allah says in Surah Al-Zariyat, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَاتَ فَعُلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So basically, 
even the practicing believers who may forget, who may need a fitma reminder. So that's why uh, Qamarul Islam said in the beginning, would like to remind the viewers of the importance of catching up before the end of this blessed month. May the Almighty Allah accept from all of us. Thank you, Qamarul Islam. Jazakallah khair, my dear Sheikh. Uh, another pertaining question that I can see that has appeared on our WhatsApp, and that is related to fasting, and that's why I'll ask you, can someone fast, and will it be accepted if he or she misses Fajr Salah due to laziness and prays it when he wakes up or she wakes up? Well, there is a sound hadith that is collected by Imam Bukhari in this respect. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, and allow me to quote the hadith in Arabic first. من نام عن صلاة أو نسيها فليؤديها متى ذكرها لا كفارة لها إلا ذلك. This blessed hadith and sound hadith means if a Muslim happens to oversleep, not deliberately, he don't go before Fajr 15 minutes and say I'm gonna take a nap. So obviously I'm not gonna wake up. It's very obvious. So if you oversleep or you forget and that happens. You know, when you're tied up with something really serious, your finals, a surgery, somebody is in the operating room or whatever. So in these two conditions, if you oversleep, you don't feel it. And you forget until the prayer time is out, then you should make it up once you wake up and once you remember it. There is no other exception but to make it up immediately. And that takes us from Islam to a very common practice by many of us, which is over the weekend, and since we don't have to get up to go to work and catch the train or the bus or the transportations and sign in and, and all of that, so we tend to be kind of uh, relaxed. I don't want to say lazy. Let's call it relaxed. So many people do not get up early like they do during the rest of the weekdays. And then, as there is Result, they turn around, oh my God, it's already sunrise. What am I going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. Remove the comfort, remove the cover, and immediately make wudu and make up the federal prayer. Why we say that you're pardoned because you're overslept? But if you flip over, you go to the bathroom, and you look, oh my God, it's already past sunrise. Let me continue. Let me take a nap. Let me wake up until before the now it becomes a major sin because you are given this pardon, this concession because you are asleep. But now you woke up. So you don't say, since it's already past sunrise, let me take a nap, let me continue, and I will wake up before the to make it up. This is a very important message that I'm certain that most Muslims are unaware of. So they think that, oh, it's already late. So it won't harm to uh, grab another couple hours of rest. So you remember. When did you remember? Well, I remember, unfortunately, I remember us after sunset. So you make a master first, then you pray Maghrib, not the other way around, because keeping the order is a must. Jazakallah khair. Now, another question that comes to my mind, the adhan of Fajr Salah is different. There is an additional extra line, as salatu khayrun min an What's the hikmah behind it? It's very obvious because all of us during the Fajr time will love to sleep. I love to sleep. You know, don't you think that, oh, those who wake up for Fajr prayer, they don't have uh, any resistance. They have zero resentment. No. Whenever we are asleep, we love to sleep, especially in winter. But when you hear the prayer is better than sleep, who's saying so? Allah is saying so. It is true that the messenger, peace be upon him, said to Bilal, say it, keep it in your adhan. So it's a sunnah, but Allah is pardon with it. And it is a reality when you get up to pray, even though you're dying to sleep, you love to sleep, the Almighty Allah definitely appreciates that. So he makes your day full of blessings. It's better in every respect, okay? Jazakallah khair. Next question on WhatsApp is, can I lay down or rest while listening to Quran? Surely. And what is the reference? The reference is in ayah number 190, chapter number 3, Surah Al-Imran, the Almighty Allah says, 
إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك سبحانك فقنا عذابا النار This beautiful ayah which as we all remember that the messenger of Allah recited from 190 through 200 the end of Ali Imran for an entire night in his night prayer and he was crying until he with his beard his lap and the floor beneath him the first ayah in this segment ayah number 190 the almighty Allah says الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ so Allah admired those who remember Allah, celebrate His praise while they are standing, yes. while they are sitting down, and while they are reclining on their sides. So the Almighty Allah said, in every condition it is permissible. Whether you're the one who's reciting or listening to a recitation. And what is the greatest remembrance or form of remembrance is the recitation when listening to the recitation of the word of Allah. So the answer is, yes, it is permissible. Jazakallah khair for that. Hope the answer is clear. Inshallah, we'll continue our WhatsApp question. But before that, our precedency always lies with the viewers who call in directly to the studio. And for international viewer, just if I can remind, if you would like to call us through our WhatsApp, then the number is 0791684 Inshallah, you can see the numbers displayed at the bottom of the screen. Let's move on to our first caller. Assalamu alaikum. We can hear you. We are live on Iman channel. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Yes, my dear brother. What's your question? So basically, um, what if someone has spiritual heart disease but they're not able to heal it because of a condition they have? Okay, stay on the line. Sheikh, is the question clear to you? Nope, it's not. I okay, brother, if you can uh, slightly, um, I think we're struggling to hear you. If you can slightly speak closer to the phone, that would be great. If you can repeat the question for me kindly, please. Okay, if someone has spiritual heart disease, but they're not able to heal it because of a condition they have, um, will they get punished for it or no? Okay, are you talking about medical illness there? Or spiritual heart disease. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, inshallah. I think the question is clear to me. Stay on the line, Sheikh. Um, it's about um, this heart disease and the hindrance behind it, spiritual illness as well he's talking about. Is that question clear? Well, I want to understand. It hinders him from what? From the prayers, for instance? My dear brother, can you hear the uh, Sheikh's uh, response? Yes, um, it doesn't really make sense to me. The main problem is spiritual heart disease. Um, I need to get rid of it, but I don't have the ability to do it. So you don't have the ability to do what? To cure my spiritual heart disease. Okay, fine. We'll come to the cureness later on. But what's stopping you? My uh, um, frontal lobe damage, because you need that to heal it, but I don't really have that. I have like okay. a bit of it. Okay, um, I think we've got the gist of your question. Sheikh, if you can slightly touch on the mental health and then link it to the spiritual um, illness that someone has. And I think the question, uh, the question is not too clear and we don't have enough time and we've got a lot of callers waiting for us on the line. So if you can just clarify with regards to the spiritual illness, what is the spiritual illness and how can we overcome? Well, in the sound hadith, the messenger of Allah, Allah, peace be upon him, said, O servants of Allah, Allah did not create any disease or ailment, whether moral, physiological, or psychological, but he has created the proper treatment for it. Then he said, so see the treatment, O servants of Allah, see the treatment. So if the disease is something psychiatrist, we know what to do. 
visit a professional psychiatrist. And my preference that he should be a practicing Muslim psychiatrist. So you will touch base on the uh, psychological and psychiatric and the religious issue. Meanwhile, okay, uh, this is very important. Some people on, are under the impression that don't even mention psychiatrists. I'm not crazy. I'm not insane. Says who that you have to be insane to visit a psychiatrist or to take an advice from him or to take a medication. There's something called OCD, uh, 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 which is uh, COD, or compulsive uh, Obsessive disorder. compulsive disorder. Uh, obsessive. The, the OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. This is not uh, uh, somebody's choice. Some substance in the brain, serotonin, is deficient. So you need to compensate to do a certain medication. I abstain from saying the medication on air because this is not a medical program. But a proper psychiatrist will diagnose the disease and will prescribe you the, 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 the medication. Then you will definitely feel better. Uh, if the problem is only with lacking for sure in the prayer, I'm not concentrating enough, I'll be more than happy to walk you through and remind you with what you do. But first, you have to know what is the problem. What are you complaining of? Because you cannot just throw a common question and uh, let the sheikh <laughs> guess it. Uh, that's not really, um, that is not really leading to providing the correct answer. And Allah knows best. Thank you very much. And to all our viewers there, obviously this show is not designed that we can give cure, a cure to, the, to any illness. For any sort of medical or health related issues, it's always best that we advise. And our guest has very clearly said, visit a qualified doctor, consult a qualified doctor and take the appropriate advice. And uh, it's also best to have a one-to-one -one conversation with a qualified scholar to also understand the spiritual matters because a lot of things that we can't unfortunately discuss on air purely due to the limitation of time. Now let's move on to our next caller. Let's he was in the line. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. You're live on Iman channel. We can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jazakallah khair, brother Imran, for calling in. What's your question? Uh, yes, my question is uh, as the Imam said at the beginning that uh, if uh, Allah misguides someone, none can guide. I've heard it from other scholars also. My question is uh, why would Allah misguide someone? Uh, isn't it shaitan who misguides? So why, why, why would uh, Allah guide but not misguides? Excellent question. Stay on the line. Sheikh, is the question clear to you? Obviously, it's clear and it is really, really important. Thank you, my dear brother. You know, it's a very good uh, question. Studies. Let's hear it from Sheikh. Sheikh, tfaddal. Studying the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will help us a great deal to comprehend some other statements. So when we say in uh, the beginning of the Quran, in the greatest chapter, You know what? An average Muslim would recite this 17 times every day. At least, at least. If you're just praying the five daily prayers without the voluntary prayers. So you end up in every unit reciting Well, you should ask yourself as well, Hey, wait a minute. I'm actually praying. I'm in the mosque, I'm in the haram, I'm doing tawaf. So I believe I'm rightly guided. Why do I have to keep asking over and over and over, guide us to the straight path? Am I not being rightly guided? Yes, you are. But guidance is not for granted. Guidance is definitely from God, but you have to work on its maintenance. The most frequently recited supplication by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was, oh Allah, the one who flips, changes the hearts, keep my heart firm on your religion, on your straight path. There is a sacred hadith in which the Almighty Allah says, Ya ibadi, O my servants, kullukum dalun illa man It begins as follows. Kullukum ja'i'un illa man at'amtu, kullukum a'rin illa man kasawtu, kullukum dalun illa man hadaytu. All of you will be starving unless if I feed you. All of you will be nude unless if I cover you up and give you the clothes. All of you will be astray unless if I guide you. Surah Al-Qasas, a beautiful ayah, was delivered to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء وهو أعلم بالمهتدين أو محمد peace be upon him you do not guide those whom you like rather it is the almighty Allah who guides whomever he wills and he knows best who is worthy of guidance so Allah has guided all of us has guided even Satan has guided the Pharaoh has guided all the non-believers in Surah Al-Insan by telling you here is the truth so take it here is a straight path adhere to it and this is the path which will mislead you take you away stay away from it that was delivered in every revelation on the tongue of every prophet but people some people choose to reject it some people choose misguidance in this case the almighty allah says he would leave them astray so did he misguide them did he choose for them misguidance no does allah love to throw people in hellfire no nope. no the almighty allah says in multiple verses in the quran how much he loves his servants and he loves for them to repent and to be rightly guided and to live in ease so the al baqarah i believe 187 chapter number two uh, the almighty allah no no it's actually 185 this is what allah wants allah wants to give you peace allah doesn't want to make your life miserable what else wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا Allah wants you to repent. Allah wants to guide you. But you don't want to. You follow those who mislead you and follow their desires and follow the misguidance. So it's your call. So when somebody chooses, when somebody chooses, not to be rightly guided, Allah will leave him astray. So whomever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves him astray because of his choice, none can guide. This is the meaning, my brothers and sisters. Jazakallah khair for that. Now, we've got very limited time, Sheikh, but um, I just wanted to touch on something that you've discussed here, the verse number 185, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2. Now the next verse after that is 186 where Allah said, Now here Allah is also responding how beautiful and magnificent he is. Can you please explain the meaning of that verse, please? Well, the meaning of this verse is very much related to what we recite every day 17 times, Ihdina, guide us. That's a supplication. And he teaches us as, as how to supplicate. We begin by Praise in the Almighty Allah. We say Alhamdulillah. Then, Rabbil Alameen. Then, exalting the Almighty Allah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Then, glorifying Him, Maliki Yawmiddin. Then, what do you need? The greatest need is guidance. And Allah the Almighty said in 186, this is the only single verse in the entire Quran in which there is a question and the answer is not forwarded when pull. So we find even in the second chapter, yes, they ask you, O Muhammad. Anil Khamri wal Maisir, yes, Alunaka, Anil Mahid, they ask you about the menses. So every time an answer is delivered, it's preceded with Qul, tell them, say, O Muhammad, throughout the whole Quran, except in this verse, there is no Qul. And that is because in the Arabic eloquence, that when the sentence is lesser, it is more eloquent. So the Almighty Allah reduced the sentence by removing the verb call, which means no time to say it. I'm already near. How near? He said it in Qaf. Nearer. 
your own juggler vein. So what you need is to ask from him directly, beg from him directly. And our messenger, peace be upon him, say to his companions, if you ever ask, you should ask from Allah. If you ever seek help, you should seek it directly from the Almighty Allah. Jazakallah khair, my dear Sheikh, for that. Now, a bit of clarification there. When he said uh, directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just in 30 seconds, if you can do justice, otherwise we'll come back from the break and we'll touch more in details. And that is, uh, some people say we can ask dua for, through pious people. Is that true? Well, as you see from the beginning to now and until we finish, and in every episode, whenever you ask me a question, Qamarul Islam, I owe you supporting my answer with a proof, with reference, with an evidence. It is not permissible to say, I think, or I believe. This is not psychology. This is not mathematics. This is not pharmacology. This is religion. And religion comes from the Almighty Allah. So if I say an answer, I should support it with a proof. Anyone Sheikh. says you can ask through people should provide a proof. Sheikh, I'll, I'll come back to you, Sheikh. Sheikh, sorry for the inter uh, interjection there, inshallah, because I want to hear the evidence in detail. But it's time for a short break, my dear viewers. Inshallah, when we come back, we'll hear in details from Sheikh with evidence. Stay with us. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel. Thank you very much. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel on Sky 757. If you have just tuned in, this is a live interactive Q&A program. And if you have questions, then please pick up the phone and dial 0203-515-0757. Alternatively, you can drop us a text on WhatsApp or to our international viewers, you can call us through our WhatsApp on 0791-684-1483. Inshallah, we will be continuing our discussion. And if I can kindly request all our viewers, those who are there with us live online, please stay with us. Inshallah, I'll be taking the phone calls in a few moments and with us Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Salah. Now before we went into a break, Sheikh, oh, I asked a very important question regarding dua and can we seek or can we ask pious people to make dua? Now Sheikh was answering that question but we had limited time. Inshallah we'll come back to Sheikh now with evidence from the Quran and Sunnah to hear his response. Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. As I mentioned briefly in the previous segment by its end, that if I ever appear on this program and I say, I think, and I believe without providing evidence, you should not accept that, neither from myself or any of my colleagues. Because this religion does not belong to me or any sheikh. All of us, our resources of information, the Quran, the Sunnah, the explanation of the predecessors, the companions, their followers, uh, the great scholars. Besides that, when you come up with an idea which opposes what is mentioned clearly in the Quran, what is stated clearly in the sound of Hadith, I would simply shred it. I would never consider it and I would not waste time to argue this claim. So right now, Qamarul Islam asked me for ayah number 186, and I quoted the ayah. The Almighty Allah said, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ After all, after Allah says, I am near. So if they need anything, let them ask from me directly. Somebody will jump in and will say, well, we can ask through righteous people. You're simply objecting to what Allah has said. <laughs> That's very weird. Add to that. I quoted the sound hadith in which Abdullah ibn Abbas, and this is a detail of the hadith, was once traveling with the messenger of Allah. He was riding with him on the same ride. And he said, oh, young man, let me teach you a few words. The principles of aqidah. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ the first two statements, if you, sh if you should ask, you should ask only from the Almighty Allah. You should seek help, you should seek help only from the Almighty Allah. 
When a man once was sitting with the messenger of Allah and there was a conversation said, well, if Allah wills and you will, the Prophet Sallallahu objected and he got angry and he said, Do you make me equal to Allah? It's only if Allah wills. So if Allah says, I'm near to you, go ahead and ask for me directly. Why would you take somebody as intermediary? While we have clearly in the beginning of Surah Az-Zumar, the Almighty Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَا So the non-believers, those in Mecca, the Meccan pagans, who used to worship Allah, Wal-Uzza, Wal-Malat, etc. Those idols, and by the way, those idols were names of righteous people. And also in Surah Nuh, وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرًا Those were the names of idols whom they used to be worshipped instead of Allah, but these names were originally the names of righteous people. When they died, the people have started taking them as intermediaries and ask them to ask Allah. But they're dead. Why would you ask them what they're dead? He said, because they're super righteous. This is how they say Satan made it seem fair to them to deviate. And Allah the Almighty judged them as polytheists, as disbelievers. The greatest act of worship, Kamarul Islam, the greatest and the topmost act of worship is supplication. The utmost, the ultimate act of worship is supplication. And if you don't supplicate to Allah directly, then you'll be associating with him others in worship. Yes, there are means of approach listed in the Quran. In Surah Al-A'raf, the Almighty Allah said, you can ask Allah through his beautiful names. Uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the Almighty Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَابْتَغُوا إِلَيْهِ الْوَسِيلَةَ وَجَاهِدُوا فِي سَبِيلِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ The means of approach, your own righteous deeds. At the time of fasting, because of your fasting, your supplication is most likely to be accepted. In sujood, because you humble yourself before the Almighty Allah and you ask from Him directly, your supplication is most likely to be accepted and so on. Jazakallah khair, my dear Sheikh, for a very clear and giving us authentic evidences from Quran and Sunnah. I hope the answers are clear to you, my dear viewers. If you have got any questions, then please use the contact details that, that are displayed at the bottom of the screen. Moving on swiftly to our next caller. Let's see who's on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. You are live on Iman channel. Assalamu alaikum. We can hear you. Brother Hanif, all the way from Bangladesh, our regular caller and viewer of Iman channel. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brother, thank you ever so much for calling. What's your question? How are you doing? My beloved Sheikh Salih, assalamu alaikum and how are you doing, my brother? Alhamdulillah wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we're doing fine. Inshallah, Sheikh will respond in a few moments. Thank you very much for always encouraging us and calling us on our live show. What's your question for today? My question is Astakrullah, Astakrullah Hal Azim wa Atubu Ilai, Astakrullah Hal Azim, Astakrullah Hal Azi wa Atubu Ilai. Are this istikfar same in reward? And which istikfar should someone say more and more? Okay. And if someone if someone says just astaghfirullah, will that be accepted by Allah? And, uh, and my second question is, uh, what is the uh, shortest Durut Sharif and what is the biggest Durut Sharif and which Durut Sharif should someone uh, say out of prayer? Um, and and th these are my questions. Uh, thank you very much. May Allah uh, grant you Jannatul Firdus. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's Brother Hanif, our regular viewer and caller on Ask Iman all the way from Bangladesh. Sheikh, I understand the questions are clear to you. Yes, they are. 
First of all, in respect of seeking forgiveness, all the different forms you've quoted are sound and have been narrated. But some of them are better than others. Why? Because some they contain and they include words of praises greater than others. So when you say, Astaghfirullah, perfect. I seek forgiveness from Allah. Then you add, Astaghfirullah al Azim. Al Azim is one of the greatest names of Allah, the beautiful names. So there is an extra word, and your seeking forgiveness is most likely to be accepted and granted. Then, Wa'atubu ilai. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that I used to count for the Messenger of Allah in the same sitting, saying, Astaghfirullah al Azim wa Atubu ilai, a hundred times or more. So also that was reported by the Messenger of Allah. In, in addition to seeking forgiveness, repenting unto him. This is perfect. And the best of the best is what is known as the master of the supplications of seeking forgiveness, which is prescribed to recite it early morning and by the end of the day before sunset. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant khalaqtani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika nastata'at to the end of the supplication which you already know. Second question, please, Qamru Islam. The second question is about what's the longest and the shortest Durud Sharif and what can we read out of the Salah? When the Almighty Allah revealed in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number 33, أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا All who you believe send your peace and salutations upon him. Much of peace and salutations, they said, how? How are we supposed to do that for Messenger of Allah? He said, you should say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. Kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alamin. Innaka hamidun majid. This is what we call it the ideal form, which is recited in the prayer. You know, they're in, <coughs> uh, in the five daily prayers in the last part of Tahiyyah, which is known as As-Salatul Ibrahimiyyah, because of the mentioning of Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. A person may also say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. That's a form, okay? The Quran says, Ya ayyuhan ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu tasliman. So you say, sallu alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin, wa sallimu. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin. And include his family, because that is in the root sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. That's a short form, and it is perfect to the point. And it is coming from the ayah of Surah Al-Ahzab. Jazakallah khair and to all of the viewers, if you would like to find out more in details about any dua and the duas that Sheikh has recited, then please do refer to Hisn al-Muslim. Now, moving on to our next question, or in fact, uh, we'll take the caller. Let's see who's next on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Jurnal Ahmad, you're live on Iman channel. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for calling in. What's your question? Uh, my question is, like, when you sit in the last rakat and, like, in the last tashawud, like, sometimes I can't read quickly, like, durud, and the imam finishes the salah. Like, if I don't read the durud, is, is my salah still accepted? Because I read quite slowly. Okay, good question. Any other question? No, no more question, brother. Thank you, my dear brother, for asking such an important question pertaining to salah. Let's hear what the sheikh has to say. Sheikh. You should finish it on your own, then conclude the prayer by taslim, without reciting any supplication after, because you should follow the imam. But because you're a slow reader, or this is what it shows, Allah knows best, so you should finish the Drood Sharif all the way to the end, then you conclude by taslim. Jazakallah khair for that important question. Hope the question is clear to you. And a uh, bit of advice there for the Imam Sheikh, if we have musallis in our congregation, perhaps not everyone is on the same level when it comes to rec recitation or reciting things correctly. What would the advice be to the Imams of the Masajid? Allah has advised the Imam to pray according to the average person. 
not to be too fast so that the prayer would be like in uh, concentration, tranquility, and khushua, nor too slow and recite a long recitation where it becomes and gets boring. So we find the Messenger of Allah says in the hadith, Man anna bin nasi If any of you happen to lead the prayer, he should make it mild. What we see nowadays, some imams are super mild. Yeah, and you can call them express imams. To the extent uh, I was traveling in one of those countries, and a masjid is so beautiful in one of the Arabic countries. But I couldn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha, let alone uh, ayat after Al-Fatiha or Surah. I said, okay. Then in Ruku'ah, I wasn't able to say Subhana Rabbi al azima even once. The Tashahud, never mind. You will never be able to reach to Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. He was super fast. I thought he's a visitor. I was filming a program in this country. So the next prayer, I found he was the local imam, the appointed imam. So I had to uh, approach him kindly and address him, Sheikh. The prayer was too fast. He said, yeah, because the Prophet said, said you should make it light for people who are weak. I said, but this is a marathon. You know, the weak can never catch up with you. And what happens? Well, I had to pray on, on my own. Because if you're not able to recite Al-Fatiha properly, as an average reciter, you're not able to say, Subhana Rabbi al azim even once, or to recite the Ruh Sharif, then in the prayer itself, you intend you separate from the Imam and you pray on your own because he is super fast. Thank you very much for that. And just a bit of advice there. If we have any concerns about regarding this issue, then let us make sure that we talk humbly, we talk politely with full other, making sure that we do not cause any more fitna. Have a one-to-one -one conversation if need be. Have a one-to-one -one consultation with the Imam. Try to understand. Perhaps a good, positive, constructive feedback may be able to help. And from this show, we can't say who is doing what, but inshallah, it's always good and encouraged to have a one-to-one -one conversation, a nice conversation, and inshallah, things will able to will be able to um, sort out those issues or challenges challenges that we have. Now, Sheikh, next question is sensitive, and of course, it's not a medical program. Inshallah, Sheikh will be giving answer from Quranic sources, from Quran and Hadith, and the question is from a sister. Um, will she be allowed to terminate her pregnancy due to sickness and not being able to take care of her toddlers or children? Now, Sheikh, if we can differentiate between normal general morning sickness with major medical condition or terminal illness, Sheikh. Well, in this case, if the doctor says the fetus poses a life threat to the mother, if she were to continue bearing the child, and continue in the pregnancy, she would lose her life. Only in this condition, we are permitted to abort the baby. But, well, I'm dizzy, uh, hyper or hypotensive, uh, diabetic, uh, whatever. Continue with the pregnancy. Only one condition which permits aborting the baby. If the pregnancy poses a serious and an imminent life threat, to the pregnant woman. Thank you very much for that. And of course, as Sheikh has mentioned, please, um, if there is any medical condition, we would always encourage from Ask Iman to seek medical guidance from a qualified doctor and make a decision accordingly. Now, another issue pertaining to this subject as well, sometimes we see in certain cultures, uh, perhaps uh, the couple have married a very recently, very young, and they've been given the very good news about it, but then there is uh, pressure from the family, or even say, for example, from husband that we have just started our marital life. We don't want to be a father or mother too early in this relationship. And they are thinking of terminating just on those kind of um, issues or reasons. What would your advice be? And that is absolutely forbidden. And it's similar to killing a grown-up human being. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, the Almighty Allah says, Woman. So the opposite is whoever takes the life of an innocent human being without any justification or the right cause, it is similar to killing all living human beings. And whoever spares such life is similar to sparing the lives of all human beings. So from an Islamic perspective, 
abortion is equivalent to killing unless if it leads to uh, the death of the pregnant woman. In this case, no, 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 no. We're going to take care of the life of the woman who's already alive. But if it is something more skeptical, we're not sure, oh, she's kind of weak. Or as you've mentioned, oh, it's too early for her to get pregnant. We were planning to postpone it for a couple of years until uh, we buy our house or we move into a better neighborhood. All of that, these are not valid excuses. It will be simply killing a living human being. Jazakallah khair for that clarification. Now, next question is again sensitive. And I will be just rephrasing or paraphrasing what the sister is asking. Um, and the question is, she believes, according to the viewer, that her own mother is creating issues uh, in her marital life and creating division between herself and her husband. Um, she is abstaining from any accusation or cursing because she is scared or she's concerned about Allah's uh, um, commandment in terms of obedience to parents. Now, obviously, we do not know what is the situation, how things are, but in general, what would your advice be, Sheikh? My advice is, alhamdulillah, you are in a healthy condition. Healthy? In what sense? Because you are able to diagnose and find find out where is the problem. The problem becomes much more serious when the wife doesn't know that her mother is maybe ruining or leading to ruining her marital relationship with her husband. So she goes with the flow. We would assume because we don't know who is a questioner and whether the case is true or false. But if you already know that, so ever your mother says, take it from here and let it go from there. Unless if it is a good thing, this is number one advice. Number two is, if I were you, I would take some nice roses and I would go to my mother, visit her, and say, this is from my husband. He says, hi. Take some, the sweet that she likes or a fabric that she appreciates or even a gold ring and say, my husband has bought you this. Or I would buy it and I would give it to my husband and says, would you please give this to my mother as a gift? I would really appreciate it. Because... In the hadith, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Tahadu, tahabu, exchanging gifts, develop love. Okay? So, being aware of the cause of the problem is actually more than 50% of the treatment. Alhamdulillah, uh, at least you know what is going on. So, avoid letting this affect your relationship with your husband whatsoever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you all safe and protected against any harm. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Now, one of the other important question I would like to ask, and that is even from my personal experience when I'm when at work or through community works or a lot of other things that we see that takes place in the community uh, through social media platform, people discuss their marital issues publicly, whether it be through their socials or through their colleagues, friends and families. Now, what does Islam has to say about that? Well, let me speak about the psychological uh, negative feedback of this behavior and attitude first. This is one of the most wrong approaches, and it's such a stupid idea. You know why? If you are not able to keep your secret, do you think others will keep it for you? Your colleague, your coworker, who may be good, may be bad, Obviously, when they go home and when they sit with others, they'll be talking about your case. So it was such a foolish idea to expose yourself without knowing, without intending. But I can assure you from now, you'll be exposing yourself. You may reconcile with your husband and you will become a loving couple again. But your colleague, your friend, the person whom you talk to will never forget, okay? And that's why we have professionals. And in the professional business, family counseling, psychologists, psychiatrists, or whatever, there are not just etiquettes, but the, uh, the what we call it, the bylaw, the constitution of the job, which is the privacy, one of the most important uh, bylaws in such jobs is the PC. 
You're not allowed to reveal this to anyone unless if it is with a court order because of a case or whatever. You're not allowed to talk about it and reveal it to others. That's why I would trust the professional psychologist or family counsel. But do not talk to everyone. Do not complain about your husband. Because one day the news will spread and it will hurt you badly, especially when your partner knows that you've been talking bad about him or her to your friends or your colleagues. Be careful. Don't be foolish. Thank you very much for that. Now, the other side to this discussion is if, alhamdulillah, we are in a relationship where our husband, our wife, alhamdulillah, loving each other, a good, strong family, and we are exposing the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on socials, and we are telling everyone that this is what my wife did for us or my husband did for us. Now, we know something about evil eye. How much information, even about ni'mah, can we discuss publicly? The evil eye is a reality. And that's why we seek refuge with Allah in the Quran by his command again is the evil eye. So we say, Sharri Hasidin Ida Hasad means I seek refuge with the Almighty Allah again is the envier whenever he envies. And the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said the evil eye is true. And it can cause a grown a person, very muscular, to be sick and die. It can cause a big camel uh, to end up in a boiling pot because, oh, the camel is dying. Let's slaughter it before it dies. And it can cause, it can lead to death. It's all by the leave of the Almighty Allah. And that's why the Almighty Allah taught us the means of protection. Reciting the greatest ayah in the Quran, 255, chapter number 2, ayat al kursi on a regular basis. By the end of every prayer, in the morning and in the evening. And reciting the three last chapters of the Quran, which some people like to call them the calls. Okay? Especially if you pull your hands together and recite them one after another. Then after the third one, you blow twice in your palms and wipe over your face, your head, and as far as you can reach of your body. You do this process three times. This is also among the greatest means of protection. And prevention is better than cure. And how to prevent the evil eye from taking place? By not revealing your blessed, uh, your blessings to others. By not exactly. talking about it before others. Your relationship with your husband is good. Keep it between you and your family. Don't blah, blah, blah to your friends. And he bought me this and he got exactly. me this. Maybe the other woman is having problem with her husband. Jazakallah khair for that beautiful final touch there. And uh, before I conclude, I'd like to thank you, my dear Sheikh, for giving us your valuable time. And inshallah, I look forward for you, with you again, inshallah, in next week's episode. Now, the important advice Sheikh has given that there are certain things we have to keep it secret. Inshallah, we'll talk about it in our next episode. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm.